I am excited to introduce our next speaker. As uh, our theme has been how systems are fueling future disruptions. And yesterday, we had Mark Racinovich come in as the CTO of our Azure business to give you a view of how systems is impacting uh, our cloud business. Today, we have the CTO from our AI and research group coming in, David Koo. David is also the corporate vice president for our um, AI core business. This is the group that uh, powers uh, the AI capabilities behind Bing, Cortana, Office, and Azure. Uh, it's uh, the group that designs, develops, and deploys the Bing Graph, the Bing uh, Ads Marketplace, uh, the Office uh, Knowledge Graph, and Substrate. David's always been a big supporter of research as well and our engagement with academia. He's the executive sponsor for our relationship with Stanford um, and uh, is very engaged with a number of communities from an entrepreneurship standpoint in connecting high-tech communities into the Silicon Valley. And he's an all-around good guy. So with that, let me introduce David Koo. All right, thank you. There you go, David. I'm all-around good guy. Well, good morning. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I would say, I would say in my many years of, of working in products that I had really the deep appreciation and pleasure to work with researchers and academia. Um, I think we're all working in this very advanced field um, of technology and products and that collaboration I just deeply appreciate and the fact that Microsoft is so deeply invested in research in academia I think it's a blessing, and I'm certainly honored to be here. And uh, what I want to do is I want to focus the theme on knowledge. Now, this is from my experience uh, in working on in search, in advertising, you know, as Sandy said, in Office, Productivity, Azure. There's a theme which is around the ability to semantically model, and we just call that broadly knowledge. And I want to share a little bit of the journey, but also encourage and hopefully frame that for AI transformations, both with the business impact and in terms of experience impact, um, I personally think knowledge is one of the core capabilities and it's a rich area for which we're still at the beginning of understanding. So I enlist all your, your creativity to help us uh, make advances in this area. So let me start out by just talking a little bit about um, the promise of AI. So there's a number that comes up, which is 1.2 trillion that's T with trillion with a T. And that's the estimate um, that IDC has of the new incremental revenue that's going to be created in three years with AI. Now, to do that and for this optimism to really come forth, there's really this belief that there is unlocked potential in the data assets um, within an enterprise or within a company that they can bring to bear to gain new insights and to change the way they interact with customers and to grow their business. So that's, that's a massive, massive expectation. In the context of our engagements with enterprises that are looking to tap into the cloud, tap into AI in their desire to transform themselves, uh, we've seen a pattern. And I want to list out the pattern of what they're looking for in their progression of applying AI to their business. Starts out with applications that are intelligent, right? Being able to take applications, point of, point of sale, specific uh, line of business applications, productivity, and make that intelligent. Feedback driven, predictive, analytical. But beyond this, uh, there's also this desire to change, use AI to change the way they interact with people. And that could be employees or that could be customers. And this is the wave of conversational AI where it's not just any set menu or interaction metaphor, it's really just this language as the interaction metaphor. And that, again, we're still at the early stages of, that, of, of exploring that trend. Uh, and then there's process transformation, like being able to understand not just analytically, retrospectively, um, the difference between BI and AIs, in some sense, the ability to predict, anticipate, and to optimize going forward, not just looking backwards. And then a general desire that the transformation of a company is complete when every aspect of the system of the company is somehow modeled uh, that allows us to reason, optimize, and to drive. And so that, that wave of business value requires a company to really deeply look at what it takes 
to be an intelligent organization. So let's dig into a little bit. You know, you know, it's no doubt that the first step to becoming an intelligent organization or for a company to be effectively embracing AI is to start with the data. Start with the data, unsilo it in many, many companies, starting with product companies but also enterprise companies. Uh, they need to start to now look at untapping the value of their data. So lots of work in understanding the quality of the data, being able to connect to all the pulses and the inputs, both in terms of real interaction with the customers and internal processes and interactions, and to be able to have the ability to model. And that requires us to really have a foundation for rapid iterations, experimentation, with all sorts of different modeling techniques. And so this modeling agility with the ability to unsilo data are table stakes. But when you start looking at what it takes for a company to truly embrace AI, I would posit that there's a third phase, which is the ability to start shifting the mindset that data is, in fact, at the core, that there's a flywheel where everything evolves around not the existing interaction with the customers, but in fact, there's a, there's a knowledge, there's a model of the business for which even software and experiences are there to help us understand that data and model better as opposed to the other way around. And that requires a really fundamental thinking of what is the core asset of a company. Now, when you look at all this and you say, hey, this seems fairly abstract and how do we bring this to life? Is this really something that happens in practice? So I wanna share a little bit of the journey that we went through uh, at Microsoft. And, Certainly we're not alone, so this is not saying that this is unique, but I think it is indicative of this general understanding and the evolution of capabilities and mindset that is in fact changing the way we look at the world. So let's start with Bing, right? Bing's a search engine, web search engine. You got lots of documents, you got queries coming in. In fact, there's a beautiful, beautiful interaction model of ranking, feedback through clicks, from which you start building out a richer and richer index of the web, of the documents, and the concepts within. So as part of that, over the, you know, as, um, as we did several years back, uh, probably 10 years back, we started working on Knowledge Graph because, hey, why stop it just going to links? Why not bring that information and start creating that information or that action that can be directly engaged without one hop away, right? So we start building this knowledge graph. It turns out to be a pretty big graph. Two billion plus entities, continues to evolve across different domains. It's open domain, many, many web pages, lots of techniques on it. But the thing that is interesting is around a couple of years ago, we start shifting it from, oh, this, that's, just, that's just a Bing graph. That's just a Bing graph. It's only useful for Bing. And we realize that what underlies it is in fact a model of the digital world, right? These are the people, places, uh, and things that happen on the web. These are digital artifacts on celebrities, people, on locations, stores. And when you look at it from that standpoint, we're starting to now create, understand both the facets, the relationships of things in the world, the public world, right? And we can start joining with structured data. And as a result, that piece of asset, that piece of asset created a life of its own. It's now valuable, not just in Bing, but it's valuable whenever you need a model of the world, which could be in office, which could be in cloud, and that's something we're seeing, this general pattern that you start out with an application feedback, but you start creating valuable assets and knowledge models that have life beyond that scenario. And let's go into the next one. So, a little bit later, my colleague Kwang San will come and talk a little bit about the Microsoft Academic Graph. And this one, think of it as, this is a graph that models research and technology innovations. And really that process of who communicates and what publish, what collaboration from what institution, and where does the flow of new ideas start to now come up from the minds of people into broader adoption and inspiring whole fields and domains. And that's another example where you can now use that aggregated signal from many, many different places, the publications, the fields of studies, and start to create that ontology that gives you predictive power on the impact of new articles or new fields. Is that a hot field? Is that gonna gain traction? These are really that model that now takes a life of its own that you can now extend to other areas. And in fact, it's not just the 
public domain. It's also in enterprises. So in the case of Office, you would say, hey, Office is just a bunch of Word, out, uh, Outlook, email, SharePoint. But in fact, uh, Outlook is in fact at this core of how people in a company interact and communicate and collaborate. So that flow of signal allows us to start creating a model of digital work. How collaboration happens, on, the, on, on what topic, how does people and organization impact that? How do we now understand the activities that people do? How do we now understand, in fact, the topics and the customers and the interactions to predict effectiveness of engagements with companies, collaboration across teams, the likelihood of information progress that are usually scattered and unstructured way. So we have massive systems where we've taken, in some sense, that journey from being and that technology understanding of, and the modeling capabilities, and we brought it to office, right? And we're still at the beginning of this journey, but this is a case where now we're saying, hey, maybe, maybe office is in fact representing a deeper understanding of how work is done, digital work, and can that create more delightful experiences, but also can that now be bolstered to help companies transform at, in the way that they interact with their employees and customers. So these are just examples where knowledge starts out from, hey, let's make an application smarter to starting to create data assets that can now inspire and connect to new scenarios. Now, once you have knowledge, doesn't mean that it's readily accessible by people, right? Knowledge is semantically organized and understandable, but humans' ability to interact and engage and to conflate um, is, in fact, unstructured, right? So, Let's take, for example, search and Q&A. You can ask in any natural language anything, but you have to somehow map it to what's known and modeled in the knowledge. Well, that requires technology. That requires understanding both how to model language, but also the information and knowledge within. You can also look at enrichment recommendations, the relatedness of concepts, so that you can start to now connect the dots. Right In the worldview that we have at Microsoft that Satya talked about, which is this intelligent cloud intelligent edge, we talked about this ability to connect the dots. So it's not just disparate interactions with different devices, it's a multi-device, multi-sensory coordinated world. And that coordination, that glue, is in fact that connected fabric of people, of things, of the environments, of the context that is the glue that starts to tie the different pieces together into something coherent. So I wanna now give some examples of the power of these experiences when you have knowledge. And this is in fact the thing that gets us excited, but again, we're at the early stages of it. So let's start with, um, nice animation. Let's go with the Bing. Uh, starting with Bing, clearly we have um, the ability to have reasonable and interesting questions around the knowledge graph. So in this case, what's the size of Switzerland? There's the knowledge graph, there are different nodes, there are different facets. Based on that, we can now derive the computations to answer that in a much more directed fashion, right? These, you can imagine this across a large number of domains. Um, but we've also recognized that that doesn't capture all the information, that there's still lots of information in the billions and billions of documents that may not be explicitly represented. And so there's lots of advances in machine reading comprehension, neural modeling, deep Q&A, and these are things that we have in Bing and also in the Maluba, uh, as well as many, many academia and research systems that are out there. And this is the case where now we understand semantically model the knowledge that's within uh, snippets, uh, different documents, warranties, and be able to now have Q&A around it. And in fact, we've taken it one step further and say it's not just one answer. In fact, there are different perspectives because when you start looking at information, it is not the facts only, it is opinions, its perspectives and the ability to surface that and to recognize that is also critical. So we have this multi-perspective answers. Now these are just examples that now go beyond the ranking of the 10 blue links to now understanding what is the inherent intent and the need uh, that people may have and how do we start to surface that knowledge that's within the web. And a lot of that requires us to now invest in technologies that now to elevate and goes beyond the indexing, the posting lists, uh, and to start to look at the organization of information and to be able to reason around it. Now, in Office, it turns out we're also starting to now bring that technology and that knowledge infusion into the experiences that you all know, like Word. So in this case, imagine you're writing some article, you're writing a paper, and you wanna know, hey, 
I got to be inspired or tell me a little bit of contextual information. So in this case, we're, we're systematically bringing what's available on the web, from the knowledge graphs, from e internal of the company, to now be contextually relevant to the things that's happening in your workspace, in the thing that you're currently working on. So again, it's a different way of bringing in that connected tissue of context that we think allows you to stay in the flow. If you look at productivity, one way to define productivity is staying in the flow where you're most productive as long as you can and bringing that contextual knowledge in a relevant integrated way to anticipate that next step is in fact a hallmark of good knowledge uh, capabilities. And in fact, it doesn't even stop at the word or the flow. Imagine you're in Excel, you got lots of different ways of describing data and values. And the fact that there's information that are referenced that may be valuable for you to contextualize. So in this case, for example, you can imagine that let's say you have the word united, but it appears in different contexts. And this is just to illustrate the complexity and the richness of the language, but also the ambiguity. So in this case, united in the last context is in fact a bunch of movies, right? But we wouldn't know that unless we actually understood the other elements be able to conflate. And likewise, in other contexts, it could be an airline, it could be companies, it could be European football, clubs, I mean, it could be many, many different ways. But again, context matters, and the ability to model that is in fact rich. And so we're only beginning to scratch the surface of bringing information and knowledge in the context of user need, in context or through explicit queries and intent. But even beyond this, the one thing that we've discovered as we start working on agents and assistants and bots is that whereas knowledge may be considered to be valuable, but it's still a nice to have. You can still get your work done with 10 blue links. You can still get your Word document done without being inspired by contextual search. But in the case of conversations, especially conversations that go multi-turn, you kind of need knowledge. And the reason is the context and the information interactions that you have in one turn needs to be passed and transferred to the next one so that you can start to reason. And that fluidness and that sharing of context across turns where the turns and the actions taken on each turn may be from different vendors, different applications, and different knowledge bases is in fact one of the hallmark challenges and opportunities in conversation design. So in this case, imagine that you're now going through this, this, um, this flow. In fact, I'm, this is inspired by our semantic machines uh, acquisition. We we're very excited to get Dan Klein and Percy to be part of our family. But in this case, imagine you say, hey, I want to go to New York two days before Thanksgiving. What is two days before Thanksgiving? What does it mean on New York? Where are the airports? How do I understand it? How do I reflect it? How do I understand the facets for elaboration? These are all things that you would say, yeah, it actually requires you to orchestrate across many, many backend systems and APIs. Each one has an ontology in some sense of the values of the capabilities. And so in this case, it's really about this ability to use knowledge to connect, connect the dots across turns, to be able to reason and contextualize, and to guide that discussion. And so in this case, take travel in New York, be able to now recognize that nearby airports of New York are JFK and this certain location. Likewise, you can now imagine each of the APIs and each of the systems having its own data, and we need to learn the association and kind of do dynamic conflation across these. Now, with all the things said, with knowledge, uh, there are many things you can do to start to now bring that knowledge in the context of interactions and flows. Uh, but how do we bring this to life? And in th this is a rich area of research uh, and product efforts. And so um, I'm not going to go through the details on this because I think you're all kind of world experts, but I do want to share a little bit of how we're looking at the dimensions of what knowledge systems, the quality, what does that mean? And also some of the challenges that we have that we think are really pushing us to the limit, but certainly an area that we'd like to invite uh, your creativity and your collaboration. So in this case, to bring knowledge systems to life, we start with the fact that, hey, data can be chaotic and it come from structured and unstructured, right? Lots of effort across different pieces, but bringing that together in some coherent knowledge production process to be something where it's fresh, highly structured, semantically understandable, that's a challenge. That's kind of the data chaos 
to the structured semantics flow. And there are different approaches. Not that one approach is better, but in fact, over time, a number of these will work in concert, right? Starting with people, right? You have Wikipedia, DBpedia, like there are certain efforts that really do require the domain experts to start capturing that knowledge in some discernible way and to be able to now create an incentive that keeps it fresh, right? Wikipedia is the great example. Almost every search engine kind of looks at Wikipedia and say, that's great, let's use that to seed our understanding because that's probably the, you know, the best articulation of the basic shareable knowledge that people interact. And that's one of the facets that I think it's important for knowledge. It's not just important for systems to understand. It is something that needs to be understandable and explainable to people, right? But beyond knowledge uh, people, at some point, you're gonna run out of steam because at some point, either the willingness or the capacity of people are gonna hit a limit. And so this is where systems start to come in. So this, this theme of systems for AI and AI for systems is in fact one of the hallmarks where I think it applies beautifully uh, to knowledge systems. So in this case, we can imagine implicit modeling. Uh, we talked about deep machine reading comprehension. We're still at the early stages of it, but again, this is a case where we're now trying to understand the shape of the language, the shape of information, and the shape of the retrieval. So lots of efforts on that. But there's also knowledge representa representations that are explicit. These are the triplets, these are the RDFs, these are the different graph structures. And there, I would say we have lots of, lots of research uh, and lots of production systems, Bing, Google, Facebook, um, LinkedIn. They are all the systems that are creating these knowledge representations, some of which are proprietary, some of which are public. And in fact, a lot of the research systems psych from the early days all the way to the research systems that exist today. So this is an active area. Now what I want to do is, is just talk a little bit about, regardless of the approach, there are different dimensions um, that we evaluate and assess knowledge, right? Is a knowledge system correct? Like what's the degree of correctness? What's the degree of freshness? What's the degree of coverage? There's a standard, but when you start looking at it, they kind of work against each other when you hit extreme scale. And in fact, that's where we end up, which is it all sounds good for 1 million documents. It sounds good for 10 million. It works really hard if you have hundreds of billion. And, and that's kind of the chaotic web. And it's not just a chaotic web. It's chaotic enterprise systems and kind of real life uh, situations. Um, so with that, let me just give some, some, some examples. In the case of correctness, precision really does matter, right? Because once you create that knowledge, you have to stand by the quality. If something is wrong, you can't just point to the source and say, well, I don't know, I think I, I extracted it, right? This is fake news, it's fake knowledge graph. Um, well, you gotta look at authority. You gotta look at authority, you gotta look at the synthesis, how do I look at voting if I don't have an authority? How do I judge? How do I get user feedback? That's a challenge, especially when you have unorchestrated multi-party sources of information. Freshness, speed matters, right? Things are constantly changing. In many cases, we don't even know what changed. Not to even mention the ability to propagate that update through the system in a way where we understand that some of the updates may in fact be incorrect. So you can actually start propagating lots of challenges with one mistake you can ripple and destroy pretty much everything. And that's the lesson we have. And, and then coverage, right? Size really does matter. At some point they'll say, great, this all sounds good, but is it complete? Does it capture that domain? So all of these work in different forces. And there are lots of systems and lots of efforts that are in fact at the frontier of this. I wanna list out some of these to both acknowledge that lots of problems still remain unsolved, but also the importance of these problems for us to get ahead in this in this world where I think knowledge is increasingly important, right? Unsupervised, unsupervised, autonomous. These are all keywords. Basically, we say we can't put humans and depend on humans to do the final verification in all the cases, right? How do I unstructure? When I look at a web page, it's not just the head sites that I can create templates and do you know, wrapper induction, site understanding. Like, can I understand the unstructured nature of information? Can I understand and cluster? Can I extract facts? Can I test that hypothesis through verification and validation? Like that's, that's a whole body of work that pushes from the head to in fact that torso tail. Knowledge and semantic embedding, right? You got lots of today explicit knowledge that's present today through years 
and decades of human aggregation or capabilities aggregation. And yet we're building neural networks and how do we seed it? How do we anchor that knowledge so that you build upon it as opposed to restart from scratch? Um, and I'll just pick another one, like multilingual, right? Language fundamentally is multilingual. In fact, information or knowledge may in fact be multilingual and multicultural. And how do you even represent that in a way in which you don't get too precise because once you get too precise, you get too brittle and there's no generalization, it's all the way to you're overly bucketing things and you're like, it's not that useful. All right, so these are lots of active research both within technology product companies in research as well as in academia. And I encourage continued innovation. We will look to partner in any and all of these. But let's share a little bit of our learnings. Like there are many things we did um, throughout all the systems that you heard about. But I'll just pick a couple that I think are really hard problems. <laughs> and we've taken steps towards it. But I think it's not a problem that's going to easily be solved. Um, but I'll just use that hopefully to tee up uh, the areas where I think there's productive research to be done. One is the inherent complexity of the real world. We talked a little bit about it. I'll share some of the learnings that we had in addressing that. The second is this symbolic versus neural approach where you can get the best of both worlds, both the ability to now explore, but also anchor on the knowledge that exists and the ability to make it understandable, explainable. And the last one, in fact, is something that we're seeing a huge swell of interest, which is how enterprises can start to take control to understand their unstructured and their digital information assets in a way that makes it available for them to change the way they interact with customers and employees. Right? So I'll just list out some of these. Each one has its own challenges. We've made some progress for it, but I wouldn't say that we've kind of cracked the nut. So let's start with the inherent complexity, right? Just to motivate this a little bit. Right? Working in web search is beautiful, right? It's chaotic, nobody has control over anything, um, and things completely change at some break, break, uh, breakneck pace. Um, but there are three dimensions that really put pressure on the things we do. Uh, one is just the logic, which is, hey, lots of detailed information describing different ontologies across different sites. At what point does it make, make sense to generalize? At what point does it become common patterns across domains? How do I now enlist uh, domain experts? And how do I now recognize that domain experts don't exist in only one company, that in fact it's decentralized and distributed? So being able to tap into that and be able to reason on um, both the domain specific but also the domain general. These are the common sense. Uh, these are the basic things on units, on basic understanding of distance. Like there are lots of things that I think are shareable and fundamental. On the time dimension, everything changes, which is just that nobody tells us that they're changing. And, and so even coming up with both the ability to detect um, the status updates, um, but also be able to see whether you can create even the incentives where they are willing to tell you that things are changing. And so to look at system to system integrations, and in the, in the space, you can imagine that the category and the domain and the scope continues to expand across domains, across facets, across entities. So in Bing, I'd say that there are a couple of pivotal points in which we've shifted um, that really grew our horsepower to tackle some of these. I'll list three of them. The first one is a shift from batch-based conflation to a streaming-based conflation, right? That's a fundamental shift. Imagine it's no longer that, hey, on Monday of every week, you take all the data sources, you do a big job, and you publish a big blob of a graph. Is it correct? I hope so, but you know that's. But it takes time. It's like you know, it used to be a couple of weeks, and um, but the web doesn't work like that. It's not a. It's not a discretized sequence of events. So we shifted into a streaming-based system, which changes everything the notion of having an incremental base, the ability to start looking at updates in a different way, the ability to now look at the incremental conflation and evolution, and even reason about correctness in a different way. The second shift we have is to start to look at going from the head to the tail, right? And that requires us to dramatically scale our ability to both manage the ontology, but also start to go into deeper site and domain understanding in an automated way, right? Again, that's an area where we're pushing more and more 
but clearly lots more to be done. And I think the last one that I think it's notable is our view of correctness, right? Correctness. It's not like everything out there is correct or in fact there are different shades of correctness, there are different confidence factors, and yet nobody's there to be the ultimate arbiter. How do we deal with that? How do we now make sure that inputs and changes that are proposed are hypothesis that allows us to reason, score, understand the likelihood of churn before it goes into the rest of the system and be able to now get that feedback. So these are just examples in which the current system continuously evolves. In fact, we, we like to say the colleague Yuqing, Yuqing Gao, who's in the audience, who's running the Satori team, would say that knowledge is always a life system. It's a life system. Like, it's not like you build it and it's done. It's a constant, constant evolution. So lots of challenges that you can imagine both systems and algorithmic advances that allows us to now tackle some of these so that it can continue to grow and evolve with the complexity of the web. The, the second area is something we've talked about already, which is knowledge can be represented explicitly or implicitly. And we've seen great advances and great promise in the neural modeling of information. Um, we've also seen the advances on symbolic, but there are pros and cons, right? At some point, the discretized representation is probably too big and too, gnar too hard to manage in the context of now joining uh, against the Nintendo context and vice versa. And so there are benefits of both. There are benefits of both. One is understandable to humans, but really computationally not efficient uh, when you start looking at the myriad of understanding the relatedness and all that stuff. And yet on neural, it's efficient, but sometimes you're not quite sure what's happening. Um, so we've taken some efforts. You know, I just list out one example, but this is clearly an active area of research that we hope that we'll see some good advances and breakthroughs. Because we're, we're, we're seeing the need to have actually both techniques uh, applied systematically. One example is, let's say you do have a neural system that allows you to model against some embedding space, and you have a knowledge graph. And the question is, how do I now use a knowledge graph to bootstrap my understanding? And the way you do that is, in order to do this mapping, we first understand the hypotheses um, that are available in terms of the questions and answers in the knowledge graph. We apply that through the system so it learns and maps it against an embedding space. Oh, sorry, I went too fast. Um, maps it against an embedding space. So over time, we can imagine that through techniques like this or similar, we can hopefully start to now bootstrap and connect and hopefully even do this in a much more integrated way. But this is an active area of research that I encourage all of you to look at and see what we can do together. Then on the enterprise, um, going back again on this enthusiasm that people have around enterprises uh, and their knowledge, right? lots, of, lots of unstructured information in people's communications, in the documents people write. People don't write in structured facets and fields, and certainly they, don't, they write it with different variant degrees of quality. And if there's a study from Gartner that says over 80% of enterprises knowledge is locked and unavailable for broader use. And that's, that's a staggering number. You talk to IT, you talk to the companies, they're saying, you know, I don't know. Like, it's all kind of black box to me. And the data continues to grow. So in the world in which data is growing massively, they're seeing tremendous value, but they can't make sense of it because they're stored in different ways, written in different formats, and not conflated. What do they do? And that's a real challenge, but that's also a real opportunity. And so let me give you one example of how this is coming to, to, to bear. Um, so about uh, late last year and early this year, we engaged with Publicis, which is an advertising agency. Uh, they have lots of agencies. They acquired like 1,200 acquisitions. They have 200 sub-agencies. They have 80,000 people. Each one, you can imagine having their understanding of clients, their understanding of the work, the advertising campaigns, their deep understanding of brands, their talent profile. So it's lots of information. So in their case, what they're saying is they want to see the benefits of scale, right? Here's an example of a digital transformation where companies really at the very fundamental level, which is the fact that I have 80,000 and 1,200 acquisitions, how do I get scale advantage? Well, to get scale, you got to bring that information and that people asset together. And so what we, we're working with them is to start to bring together their understanding of their talent, understanding of their accounts, understanding of the work they've done, and start to create 
really this ability to now reason, map, and correlate, right? This is something that I'd say that if you're an online company or a commerce company, you just do this. But for enterprise, this is all new stuff. This is all new stuff, and in fact, it requires a deeper understanding and appreciation of how do you reason with knowledge and to get that line. But in the course of these engagements, we also recognize that enterprise knowledge is unique. It's unique, it's got its own unique challenges in two dimensions. One is, they're, they're, you know, data in enterprise is not readily accessible to everybody. It's not like it's a public web document that anybody can read. This is private email, right? This is documents that are sensitive. This is the you know, ACP documents. There are lots of information that you just cannot even see. Um, and enterprises have obligations, both in terms of regulatory compliance, right? Certain financial data, certain HR data can't be shared. There are certain encumbrance commitments. If you get data from third parties, for whatever reason, you have obligations to limit its scope of use. You have security considerations, different people have different access rights, and you have privacy with GDPR, that ability for end users, both employees and customers, to now have control, and that ability to influence that data is critical. So all of this is creating a case where, in many cases, we're not quite sure how do you build an AI model when you can't reliably see the data. Uh, that's a real challenge. So within, within Microsoft, in Office, for example, we have different practices. We keep all the highest standard, and we, in fact, enlist the users, in this case, Microsoft employees, to contribute a portion of their email for us to build the models. But you can imagine new techniques and new approaches are needed for us to get beyond this hump. And that is not necessarily the same algorithms and approach that works in the web and in public data can work in the enterprise setting. So lots of innovations around multi-party secure computations, private computations that are uh, potential here. But perhaps the most challenging is that their access to the data within an enterprise is of mixed uh, degrees of quality and completeness, right? It's a bootstrapping problem. Hey, I'm interested in doing all this, but the data may not be clean. It has the varying degrees of quality. It may not be complete. In fact, in order to bring that domain expertise, it's typically diffused. And it's not any one organization has that depth, and certainly not the same, uh, the talent that knows the domain doesn't necessarily understand the systems. Um, so with that, I would say um, we're at this stage where my, we are seeing this desire to transform, and knowledge is increasingly this fundamental capability that is starting to reshape the way we think about information and interactions. And so I would just uh, say that imagine, fast forward a couple of years from now, where you're saying, imagine you're living in a knowledge-rich world. Every person has behind him or her this rich knowledge graph of their activities, interests, interactions, relationships. Every object, every physical space has its own knowledge graph that's created from different organizations for different purposes. And every service has its own associated uh, uh, knowledge. Bringing all that together in some coherent way where they're multi-party, they aren't working together, and yet you need to now attest and navigate and interact in a fluid way across is a real opportunity, but it's a real challenge. And so with that, these are some of the questions and domains, and, and, and it is hopefully there to inspire that I believe we are heading in a way where we are gonna see a knowledge ecosystem. We're gonna see knowledge technologies for both the production and the consumption of knowledge. It will require different teams and different people to work together, and we're still early in this research and technology innovation wave. So with that, let me bring in my colleague, Kwang Sung, to come talk to us about one example of how we want to push on this process. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good morning. Uh, it is my pleasure and to be here to talk to you about knowledge system and AI. After all, it was eight years ago in this very venue, uh, Microsoft Research uh, Faculty Summit uh, in 2010, that we first described our ambition to teach the machine to acquire knowledge from the web by itself. Um, in, addition, in the ensuing years, in addition to the continuing uh, investment from uh, Microsoft that David has just described, we are glad to see uh, that the idea, the little idea presented eight years ago has received industry-wide adoption, including 
the uh, Google uh, Knowledge Graph uh, efforts two years after our faculty summit and the Baidu's announcement in SIGIR 2014. So today, it is my pleasure uh, to be here to share with you the next evolution uh, for us to share the resources we have uh, from the industry research lab uh, with the, uh, 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 that consists of a data set and open source tools that can facilitate research uh, with the hope that more of you can join us uh, to the, in a journey to advance the state of art of knowledge systems and AI research. So let me start with the data set. Uh, this is, as David alluded, uh, Microsoft Academic Graph, uh, like the uh, Bing Knowledge Graph. It is, it, is uh, it is built by extracting the large from the entire web. And so we have the scale uh, to cover uh, the, uh, all the uh, uh, scholarly communications published in the past one and a half centuries. So speak, uh, speaking of an ecosystem, this is knowledge graph that every one of you uh, is already on as a node. So is every student that you have supervised, every institution that has sponsored your work, all the journals that you have cited, and the conferences that you have gone, you have gone to present your work. Um, so as you see, the number is increasing, very, uh, is, is massive, and it's growing rapidly. Right, so um, one of the uh, um, benefit of sitting on top of Bing is we have the broad coverage. So as you can see, that we have teach our machine to go beyond computer science and to cover more than 200,000 uh, fields and subfields. Uh, including medicine, art, history, and so on. This broad coverage turns out to be very important uh, for research managers uh, and your provost and dean maybe uh, to understand the impacts, broader impacts of our research and for many uh, decision makers to determine the investment or research. So I hope that this is give you some incentive to take a look at the data, but for us, it gives us a strong incentive to push the technology to make sure the data quality is here. Uh, being researchers ourselves, we naturally have published a paper to describe how this graph uh, is created and what we envision it can do. And the easiest way uh, to find this paper is to, under, to remember it is published in www.2015. And so you can just, if in, in, in this system, you can just type www.2015 and right there, you can see all the papers uh, published in this year, in, in, this, in that year, and our paper is actually called in rank number two on, on, on the search results. So there are two things immediately uh, that you can notice. The first is the query. Uh, so by recognizing the conference as a first class citizen in the knowledge graph, we can, un we can actually do more uh, query, uh, search better search experience by not just keyword matching uh, the query terms to the title. And I understand that many of, many of my colleagues have been using this feature uh, when they are running the Test of Time Awards committee uh, to find uh, uh, papers and, uh, and their citations uh, for the particular venue. And this tool, you can, do, you can do it with a single query in this tool. And I can, I'm also glad to report for the past two years, since I discovered this new usage, I've been watching it. And our ranking system has been able to predict the test of time awards winners quite accurately. And that's actually the second uh, thing that I would like to talk about. The ranking here is actually the full-blown search ranking, and it's not just based on citation counts. As you can see, uh, the uh, the second, the third search result has actually received more citations than than us. Um, and so, but uh, the ranking algorithm here is actually also estimating the reputation of the citing parties, and not just blindly count the citations. So, I'll, I'll be more than happy to talk more about it with you uh, afterwards. Right. So. Um, if this trend continues, uh, I'm predicting that in WW 2025, uh, this paper about a neural representation of a knowledge system uh, is likely the winner of the Test of Time Awards. And this paper, is, coincidentally, is from my colleague uh, in MSRA, Jian Tang. Now, for many of you, for speaking of Jian, uh, 
who has, who ha unfortunately, to have a very common name, and many of you to have the common name, to get your research results uh, aggregated correctly on the search engine has been a challenge, isn't it? Right? Uh, so let's try it uh, for my colleague, Jen. Uh, if you try to search uh, with your favorite uh, search engine, keyword-based search engine, you will see, well, yes, all there are t t quite a few gen town in the system, and the, the results are actually intertwined together. But because uh, this system is sitting on top of a beam, we were able to use uh, all sorts of knowledge, including your CVs and resumes published on the web, and to actually learn how to disambiguate uh, different authors. So for example, when you, in this system, we actually, when you hover uh, over different names, uh, inter internally at the back end, we actually understand which Jian Tang is which, and not to mention all sorts of other uh, variation. Uh, our physics colleagues like to publish their, their, their paper with only first initial and last name, and in many uh, publications, they actually up, uh, observe the Asian convention by putting family first rather than last. And so these are all uh, different uh, hypotheses we put it here. Uh, as I alluded, it, as you already seen, you can ju just hover over it. In this case, this is our colleague, uh, Jian, what I want, and just a, a, one additional click, voila, all his work uh, is aggregated correctly uh, and showing here. So this is, I hope this is give you a uh, quick uh, understanding about what the uh, knowledge system can help us and how you can enrich uh, the, uh, the experience we have. And so let's now sh uh, switch back uh, to the, the PowerPoint. So he here's, so if you are interested, find this useful uh, and interested, uh, these, are the re these are the resources we are making freely available to everyone. The first one is the graph, the data sets. Uh, it's available through Azure. Uh, we uh, Again, freely available to everyone, and then there's a uh, so. And in the same folder, you will find a lot of open source tools that hopefully can actually j jumpstart uh, all these uh, operations to deal with large data set and create knowledge systems. We encourage you to take a look, uh, and uh, as you see, we have already more than a hundred uh, systems, tw 127 systems. Uh, that are already published based on this data set. I invite you to take a look and tell us what you can build. Uh, more information is the URL, uh, aka.ms, MSR Cat. With that, thank you for your attention, and let me welcome David back. All right, thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay, well, let, me, uh, let me wrap it up. Um, if you roll back at the beginning, what we're seeing is this emergence of an appreciation for knowledge. Knowledge is going to push the limits of systems and AI, but it has a transformative effect in the way we think about products and we think about companies. And this is also a rich area where we're still at the forefront of that technology race and that technology push. And with that, I want to really thank all of you for your attention, your participation in the Faculty Summit. I'm excited that Microsoft is such a strong advocate for academia and for research. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing amazing things uh, from all of you and from our collaboration. So thank you. <laughs>